thanks so much, Dave, and thanks to all of you. Um, I, I just, before we get into my presentation, I want to say that I just thank Brian for, for teeing up uh, the, the discussion of smart, smart speakers uh, so well, because I think one of the points that he made is, is right on, and that is um, there is a need for us to have a strategy in place. Uh, for our engagement in those areas. Um, but the smart speaker uh, space isn't just about smart speakers. And I wanted to start out with a, uh, a video uh, showing what I mean about that. Alexa, ask Kit to pull the car Can out Can you bring the up the audio? Your Tesla out of the garage. Keep an eye on it. Well, yeah. Uh, so what you've got here is is how hobbyists are engaging uh, in this community, and I think that that's one of the uh, the pieces to keep in mind. You know, all of us are, are hobbyists at heart in one way or another. And what you had here was you had, you know, uh, a hobbyist give the utterance of bring the Tesla out of the out of the garage. It automatically opened the garage door, and the car move, moves out. And you've got uh, you've got a drone uh, flying autonomously, shooting the whole thing. Um, so, is that where we're going t tomorrow? Well. That's where this hobbyist is going tomorrow. And uh, I think that's one of the things that, as we talk about the, the developments going on in this space, is something to keep in mind. How do we get to something like that? So we're going to look a bit at the, uh, the state of the, uh, the smart speaker uh, marketplace. Again, looking at it from the, the foundations of strategy. Uh, not just simply uh, what are the numbers, but what do the numbers mean to us. Uh, we'll also look at, uh, at how we can build our environment uh, to the smart speaker uh, ecosystem, and a few implications uh, for broadcasters. And, and when I was actually mapping out this presentation a couple of months ago, um, it, it was a very different presentation. There have been a few developments that have come up uh, in the past few weeks that uh, I think are really important for us to discuss. Uh, one is the, uh, the development of the uh, voice-controlled prototype hybrid radio uh, project uh, between uh, Pilot, uh, which is NAB's uh, innovation arm, and uh, the Fire TV uh, recast, uh, and what that uh, is going to mean as far as integrating with the, uh, the smart speaker environment. So the evolution of the, uh, the smart speaker has really been only going on for about three and a half years, uh, starting in, uh, in 2015. And we have you know, new form factors uh, coming out uh, all the time. I, I think one of the things uh, that we have to, to ask ourselves as we're developing uh, services for these platforms is, you know, have these devices become commodified or um, you know, are, are there perceived differences? Uh, you know, anecdotally, uh, they, they feel like different systems uh, when engaging with any, any of them. And just to use Alexa as an example, um, you know, I, everybody I know who has one of those devices in their house refers to Alexa as she. Uh, and it doesn't seem to be only because of the name. Uh, the, the smart speaker installed base has changed uh, quite a bit. Uh, these are some figures that, uh, that have recently come out. The last time uh, I presented on this, uh, the, the Apple HomePod was, uh, was not even uh, showing up on this figure, and it's now showing up at 4.5%. Uh, Amazon, which uh, had a market share of about 80% at one time, uh, has gone down to about 60, uh, 65%. Uh, and Google is, uh, is up around 20%. And the way that those numbers have been moving is Google is, uh, is gaining market share in this, in this area. So as far as when you're looking at, at what platforms you're going to develop for, keep those things in mind. But also, 
one of the things that you really need to think about is the platform differentiation. Uh, namely, how much development can you do for these platforms? Um, the Google Assistant is, uh, is what I would call uh, somewhat open. Uh, Alexa is, is open. They have a, a full uh, software development kit that, uh, that is available. Uh, and they encourage development, both on the software and on the hardware side. And we'll see some of how some of that uh, encouragement has, has come to bear uh, in the future. And the, home, uh, the HomePod Surrey environment has been mostly closed so far. Um, where are they going to go? How is that going to change? And, and how is that going to work over time? Um, so one of the foundations for, the, for Google Assistant is, that, um, is the Google Translate uh, engine. And there's actually quite a bit of cross-pollination between the Google Assistant team and the Google Translate team. Uh, so one of the things that you would expect is that, uh, that Google Assistant uh, and those, that group of products would be able to scale things like language, multi-language functionality and support. Uh, rather quickly. Uh, the Google Assistant search functionality is also very strong. Um, Alexa's uh, strength um, is in its connection to uh, commerce. Um, that being said, remarkably few users, as Brian said, remarkably few users say that that's important to them and, very, and, and few are using that connection to commerce piece, probably because finding you know, and searching for, uh, for devices is difficult or for, for products is difficult. Uh, so, and the HomePod has a very strong tie to uh, music and is about at the top of the market as far as, uh, as quality goes. The U.S. smart speaker uh, shipment forecast for 2018 is, is at uh, 39.2 uh, million total uh, smart speakers. Um, so no matter how you cut it, this is really an important, uh, important and exciting time if you're interested in this space. And people are bringing these uh, devices in more and more places into their lives. Okay, they may have start at, started out with, uh, with one uh, larger device in the living room, but uh, as the prices have come down, if you're looking at you know thirty dollars per device, you're bringing it into the the kids' rooms uh, to have it read you know bedtime stories, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. You're bringing it into uh, all basically anywhere that you could want it, even the garage, as we saw earlier. And the the adoption rate has been uh, has been rapid. Um, Smart speaker adoption is, uh, is likely to be faster, according to this slide, than uh, any other consumer device uh, in history, uh, in faster even than the, uh, than the smartphone. Um, so with this and many installed units out there, uh, being able to connect with, with our audiences uh, through these uh, devices is, is very important. So by 2020, 75% uh, of U.S. households are forecast to own a smart speaker. Um, and projecting out a little bit uh, further than this, analysts see that that, that adoption curve uh, just flattens out. And part of that is, is a result of the S-curve, but also part of this is the result of, um, of this proliferation of devices. Okay, the fact that you will have um, the ability to interact with the smart assistants regardless of whether you have a smart speaker or not. So is, you know, do you have a smart picture frame? Do you have smart, uh, you know, fire detectors? You're, if your smart assistant is everywhere, do you need that installed smart speaker hub uh, to drive interaction? And I think that's really takes us to that smart speaker ecosystem. So the, the smart speaker is really, for most purposes, is a gateway to connect with those services that you want to use. And um, you know, will one day the smart speaker effectively be an ex extraneous device um, 
because you can get the content that you want from a wide variety of, uh, of connected devices. And, and that, uh, that evolution is already starting to occur. So the digital assistants are moving out beyond the smart speaker and the smartphone. And Alexa can also be found in a wide variety of, uh, of devices. Um, so last month, uh, Amazon introduced two new devices as part of this, uh, this large product offering that Brian mentioned. Uh, two of those were a, a smart wall clock, uh, and that could be because one of the top uh, utterances through the Alexa device is, what time is it, exactly? So it seemed like a perfect fit. Um, the microwave is an interesting one um, because in, in their product demonstration, they, they went through making microwave popcorn. And I wasn't necessarily sure that that was a, a challenge for folks, having to press the button, the popcorn button, you know, one time. Um, and for those of us who really like to, uh, to watch football or the baseball playoffs and not get off of the couch in order to get your popcorn, unfortunately, you're still going to have to put the bag of popcorn in the microwave for right now, but uh, I think we can look forward to a day, yes, when, uh, when we won't. Um, so Alexa is also becoming a way that we play with toys, and, and again, some of this is, is hobbyist level uh, experimentation, but you know, last year there, there was this, uh, this set of products, and they're called the, the Beat Bugs, uh, and they will sing along to, uh, to Beatles songs, and uh, so it, it's that level of, of entertainment and engagement that, that are people looking for that? Well, we're having folks who are experimenting right now. And Alexa's, Alexa is also uh, coming to the car, uh, and we'll talk about, uh, about how uh, Alexa is integrating into the in-car environment uh, more in a little bit uh, later. So, Talking about the, uh, about the human interface uh, is, is something that, uh, that Amazon uh, talked about back at CES in 2017. Uh, they're not viewing uh, voice uh, interaction as just a, you know, a, 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 I don't know, a small thing, okay? They're viewing this as the next frontier in human interaction. So, if you, I know that this, uh, this photograph here is, is difficult to see, but if you go back um, right here, you're talking about the first evolution would have been uh, you know, the character uh, mode, MS-DOS uh, era, then going into the uh, graphical user interfaces that uh, came forward with, uh, with Macintosh and, uh, and Windows. Uh, the web they, they see as the next uh, level after that. Uh, mobile uh, interactive and voice as an evolution on top of that. Um, so from a content creation point of view, if the user experience changed when you moved from web to mobile, the same would be necessary. Uh, the same level of, of understanding would be necessary. And one of the things that they were talking about in this session, and, and this really was a more of a tutorial than anything else, is understanding how the command structure works when you are moving into voice. It's a, it's a very different idea, it's a very different navigational scheme than uh, what you would see with the web or mobile. So how do you extend that, uh, that voice user experience to the car? Well, in many ways, it's already there. I mean, I think that for, uh, for many folks, that, that voice experience has maybe the first time you interacted with a, a voice assistant was in the car. And so voice has had a presence there for some time, but Am Amazon is looking at how to extend that presence uh, to the, this space itself. So Amazon understands that, that the connected environment uh, changes when you're in a car. Uh, I did a, a road trip in the Southwest uh, over the, uh, the summer, and I'd say 80% of the time that I was in, 
in New Mexico, I'm in the desert, we had no, uh, no wireless system, uh, services. So if you're, if you're looking at uh, connectivity from that uh, standpoint, what do you do? Uh, do you just say, okay, well, it's acceptable to have no service uh, or not be able to interact with my car uh, while I'm in these dead zones throughout the country? Uh, or are there ways to throttle those services back? And that's what, what Amazon is looking at. And I think that that's something that we should look at for our services as well. Are there certain services uh, that will work on this basic offline mode uh, where Alexa would still be able to access uh, device control, things along those lines, even while it didn't have wireless services available to, to it. So what does that have, what implications exist there for other form factors, uh, be it uh, disconnected radio operations uh, or other, other pieces along those lines? And in that regard, um, I, the uh, last month at, uh, at uh, IBC and a couple of weeks ago at the, uh, at the radio show down in Orlando, um, EBU and Pilot uh, demoed uh, a, a hybrid uh, radio uh, that is, uh, is voice controlled uh, and it's compatible with, uh, with both DAB and FM broadcasts. And uh, what I'd like to do now, I'm going to roll another uh, video uh, to show you how that works. Can you raise the volume? A particular radio station. And uh, the voice assistant will go out and find the URL which corresponds to the stream for that radio station. And then what our technology will do is intercept that URL, compare it against a list of the locally available stations. And if, if, if it corresponds to a locally available station, it will play the FM signal instead of the stream. So let me demonstrate that. Alexa, play WDBO. News 96.5 WDBO from TuneIn. Now, you know, Fox and Friends it said, morning, I'm going to mute uh, this now. For the now. three hours, I was hardly off. It said that it was from TuneIn, but the little <laughs> FM in the corner of the screen there indicates that actually it's from the FM. So that's this is a very early prototype, and one of the things that we'll, we need to do is adjust the, the program so that when the FM is being played, it, it says it's playing it from FM and not from TuneIn. So let me demonstrate that again with a different station. Alexa. Play star 94.5. Star 94.5 from TuneIn. Same thing. It's playing it from FM, not from TuneIn. There it is. Any questions? So... As you can see there, um, and I, could it, anybody hear the video? Uh, okay, so David could hear it, so uh, th that's good. Um, so what was going on there was is that the, the utterance was calling for the, uh, the radio uh, station, and uh, it was going and, and looking up the radio station uh, using uh, radio DNS, and then uh, if the station was available over the air, it was sending it back and connecting it through the, uh, the FM radio signal instead of streaming it back. Um, so the, the, how does it all work? So the user asks the, the branded voice assistant for content uh, and there is a pilot uh, EBU module uh, that is uh, built onto a Raspberry Pi uh, that uh, intercepts that response and analyzes it. And it looks for over-the-air options and, uh, and delivers those, uh, those services in the way that the broadcaster's preference is. Uh, and as, again, it uses uh, radio DNS uh, to, as the back end to look that up. Uh, this prototype was built into a Frontier silicon-based tabletop radio, the, uh, the Pure Elan E3. 
Uh, and again, the Raspberry Pi processor uh, serves as the, the middleware between, uh, between the, uh, the radio and uh, the voice assistant uh, that you would want to use. So Pilot and EBU uh, intend to release uh, the proof of concept code on a royalty-free basis uh, to manufacturers for use in the production and implementation uh, of voice assistant devices. So we can also look at uh, how this impacts uh, the television uh, arena as well. Um, so devices are now responding with, with more than audio, and I'm, we're not just talking about uh, the two, you know, echo devices with screens. You have um, voice assistants that have been built into um, cable devices in uh, Apple TV and, uh, and other devices as well. Uh, a few months ago, uh, Amazon released their Fire TV Cube. Uh, and this cube comes equipped with uh, an IR extender that allows control of other devices in the home environment. Um, the product is met with some mixed reviews, and so while it uh, does support input switching, uh, volume control, and channel change uh, in certain contexts, uh, the device does not work consistently on all cable systems, uh, and channel change is not supported in the over-the-air reception environment. Uh, and if you look at the, uh, the re product reviews out there, uh, that's one of the things that you know, a few days after it came out, they were, the reviews were, were hammered for, for the lack of channel changeability for OTA. Um, and I, I'm interested to see how this, this product set uh, evolves, um, but we may, um, we may have an opportunity to see, you know, how, that's evol how that evolves uh, pretty quickly. Uh, so on November 15th, uh, Amazon is uh, releasing their, um, their Fire TV recast, which is specifically uh, an OTA product. Uh, it's uh, in gonna, going to be in the uh, 225 uh, price point range, and uh, it's a an OTA. It's a set of OTA tuners. Uh, I think four tuners built in, uh, and a DVR. Um, and while the Cube did not support uh, include support for OTA, this does. OTA is the recast's complete reason for existence. And they are saying that it you know, integrates smart speaker support from day one. Uh, this I pulled from their ad last night. Uh, control the Fire TV re uh, recast with your voice using Fire TV uh, or Echo Show. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what we can do uh, in the TV space as far as integrating with those areas. So, how, are, how will viewers find us with the recast? Well, one of the things you can do is you can go in and look at the development documentation. And because all of everything that uh, Alexa is doing is, is a pretty open environment, again, you know, we're developing devices and skills in this area, uh, one of the ways that you can find out where they're going with this is uh, with, by looking at the APIs. Uh, they started out with, with a simple uh, ch uh, channel change uh, API, and they've moved into creating all of these uh, APIs around video services, uh, recording, uh, playback, uh, how that works, uh, search in the video environment. Uh, so going through and you know, having your teams, your contractor, you yourself, hobbyists, go through and figure out what are the best ways for our viewers and listeners to find our services is a wonderful way to approach this. So what are some of the other impl implications for broadcasters on this? Re regardless of the, the devices and the, the pieces, how do we uh, interact with these, uh, these devices and, uh, and you know, approach it in new ways? So again, the audience for this is, is real, and I think, you know, I, I can't, don't want to get too far without talking about the NPR report that was, uh, was released uh, in uh, conjunction with Edison Research back on April 5th. And on November 2017, 3.9% of all of live streaming of N NPR content took place on Alexa. In February, that's a 
what is it, three short months later, that number was then at 13% of all live streaming was taking place through Alexa devices. The Edison Research Smart Audio Report states that 71% of owners are, are listening to more audio content and 31% in that same study are listening to more radio content. You know, as Brian said, you know, some of the key activities that, um, that users want out of these devices are broadcaster <coughs> core competencies. And yes, music is one of those, but also you know, checking the weather, streaming news, you know, streaming podcasts, and finding local businesses are all things that are important to us and to what we do. And being able to you know, help our, our listeners and viewers connect with the best of breed content that's out there is one of the things that we need to be doing too. So skill discovery is still a challenge, but it is improving. Uh, it's something that uh, you know, greater, greater than 50% of users report adding a third-party skill uh, to the device. Uh, you know, Amazon, for one, is trying to make that uh, simplified, easier. Uh, they've removed you know, certain language. Uh, the open word used to be something that you had to do in order to invoke a third-party skill, and you don't have to do that anymore. But broadcasters do have a distinct advantage uh, in this area, and that is with uh, over-the-air promotion. We're able to utilize our content uh, stream, our other outside content streams, to promote the existence of this on these platforms. So what are some other things that, uh, that we can do? Uh, so getting on the, on the platforms today, this was a, a question that I was asked to address on this. It's how do you get onto the platforms at all? I was like, well, if you're streaming, you may already be on the Alexa platform. And you if you've partnered with iHeart or TuneIn, then you're on the platform. Uh, if not, uh, and you don't want to, uh, developing a skill to connect your stream with the utterance of your choice is a simple task for a web developer or contractor. Um, so there are other th pieces as far as how do we, ex other than you know, putting out your primary program stream, whether you're uh, TV or, uh, or radio, what are some of the other things that people are doing or can do uh, as ways to engage with their audiences? So. Voting, choosing things, uh, is, is something that, uh, that iHeart did very early on, uh, working with Ryan uh, Seacrest to ena enable um, users to vote on the iHeart Awards through the Alexa device. Uh, they also utilized their, uh, their talent uh, in doing so. So it wasn't, this shows uh, Ryan Seacrest playing around with, I think it was the Google Home in this case. Um, but the idea here was uh, that the, uh, the user utters that they want to vote on the iHeart Awards, and then Alexa isn't the one that responds, it's Ryan Seacrest that responds. So it's utilizing uh, your talent in ways that, uh, that are you know, extremely valuable and extends your brand. You're not empowering you know, Alexa to make you know, engage with your audience, you're empowering your talent to engage with your audience. Uh, Hubbard has uh, integrated their uh, listener rewards program uh, directly into, uh, into the Alexa device. And so listeners who would receive rewards through listening through, uh, through mobile are now uh, receiving uh, similar benefits uh, through listening through the Alexa platform. Um, Many, uh, many broadcasters have, uh, have built skills, custom skills, to launch our podcast, and that seems like it's a, a natural uh, piece to do for, for any of these platforms. And uh, looking at how you uh, tailor the delivery of news, weather, and sports. So flash briefing is built into Alexa, and, uh, and you can certainly go in and, uh, and provide services to flash briefing. The thing to look at, again, it's, it's all about how do you utilize your talent, how do you utilize your talent uh, well to deliver those spots onto these platforms. 
Um, so, and the audience does expect a, uh, a different experience uh, in these areas. They want uh, shorter pieces of information. Uh, so it, it's not simply a matter of delivering your, your primary program streams. It's really looking at what does the audience expect uh, in this area. So what does that extending that engagement look like? Um, over at, uh, at IBC last month, uh, independently, but they were both talking about it, so I'm like, I've got to talk about it with you guys too. Um, BBC and German broadcasters instant, uh, independently have created locally focused children's bed bedtime story skills. Okay, um, now I, I liked reading to my, my son the first two books. <laughs> <laughs> But um, around the fourth or fifth or sixth book, I was tired of that. So I think one of the things, this is a, a common experience that, that we've all had, but are there ways to provide those types of local connected services that your audiences want in different ways? Um, gaming, uh, contests, game shows are other things that, uh, that from a radio side, TV side, we do a lot of, are there ways to, uh, to utilize these devices to help us in, have further engagement with our audiences in those spaces? So if the NPR data bears out across all stations, uh, is there a way to engage our audiences using the broader internet of things? Uh, and one of the areas that I haven't talked about is this gadget class of devices. Um, all, Amazon came out with these a little while ago. Uh, the buttons up here um, are the first of those de devices to be productized. Uh, and what this allows you to do is you can have a game show uh, setting and allow you to buzz in like folks who do on Jeopardy um, and, and play along um, with one another. Uh, I guess this was back in, uh, in June, uh, the first Alexa-enabled a board game uh, called When in Rome uh, came out. And again, you know, Alexa is really good at guiding you through prompts, providing uh, audio feedback and, and services along those lines. And is this something that you know, broadcasters can do? We could, but maybe it's not the, the best thing, best way for us to do. But this is how our, our viewers and listeners are going to be engaging with these devices, and it's important to understand that in the context of the services uh, and pieces uh, that we build out for it. BBC, uh, in the interactive area, BBC recently published uh, research into their efforts into interactive storytelling. Um, it was this strange sci-fi story that you had to be very highly engaged in, uh, and nobody liked it. Nobody liked the story. Um, and when I say nobody, I mean 16%. And if you can only get 16% of people to like your story, then it's got to be really bad. Um, but 63% of them liked interacting with the story. So, you know, we've had interactive storytelling for years. I mean, I grew up with Choose Your Own Adventure books. I think it, you know, most, of, uh, most of you folks have as well. Um, and, and these findings cross demographics as far as the enjoyability goes. 91% uh, of the focus groups knew when to reply instinctually uh, to the interactive prompts. Now, it could, that could have had something to do with good scripting, or it could just be that people do know, you know when a conversation prompt comes, when you're supposed to respond. And that was something that was uh, good to note as well. So 92% reported that the story required their full attention but 71% didn't like it. <laughs> Why? They just wanted it on in the background. You know, th that's how I think we need to look, one of the things that we need to look at with these smart assistants and these, uh, these speakers is that do we want them front and center or is having them meld further into the background of our lives something that we want? Or does it depend on context? So, some of the key takeaways from the report was that you need to create a personal experience uh, using the, the user's profile information, utilizing the technology. Uh, if you're able to create that more one-on-one, -on -one, 
placing their name in the story, things along those lines, uh, helps. Also, set some expectations for your users. Uh, do some onboarding tasks as far as letting them know, you know how long are they going to be engaged in the story, how long, you know, in what ways is, are they going to be engaged. Uh, helps guide people along. Uh, and one of the things that they were not expecting was this story was meant to be consumed on a one-to-one -one basis. Basically, it was supposed to be for one user to engage with Alexa in the story. But there were a lot of users, I think it was something like 20% of them, that engaged with, the, uh, engaged with the story in a social, at, uh, social atmosphere. And namely, they said they brought family into the room, friends into the room, and said, let's do this together. And when building experiences for the future work, that's one of the things that they're looking at doing. So as far as, as other recommendations as far as, as what to do, how to engage further, how to see where the technology is going. At least for Amazon, I would recommend uh, engaging with uh, the, the, Amazon, the Alexa community. Um, the Alexa developer uh, website, which is right here, developer.amazon.com, uh, provides fantastic information. Um, in the past uh, six months, you could see where they were guiding the product. They were talking about you know, visual support for non-visual skills, uh, how to utilize ga uh, gadgets. They were offering bounty for, bounties for uh, skill development specifically for kids. And all the skill development for kids was right before they re released their, uh, their kids platform, their kids uh, de de uh, developed uh, product there. So those are some, uh, some areas to look at. It's an invaluable, uh, invaluable tool for developers and non-developers alike. Mm -hmm.